Welcome to Hot Weekly. I'm Crystal. And this is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast about the haunted attraction industry. We cover everything from your haunt aficionados to your home haunters to the actors and owners and operators of the large major haunts. I am Jonathan. As you just heard, this is Crystal. And we have a topic that's a little different than our previous ones we've done so far. Right. This will be the first one that could help people in the actual industry who are already making money off of their haunts yeah. instead of just little home haunters. Or people thinking about haunting. Basically, we wanted right. to do a business topic. Yes. Because haunting is a business. It is. It's a passion. It's a lie. I don't think anyone does this no. to get rich. This is like teaching. If you're doing this to get rich, you're stupid. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, that I'm might be a little, little bit misleading. <laughs> but you know what I mean, though. People do this not because they want to get wealthy. They do this because they love it. Right. It's, it's a passion for career, but it is still a business at the end of the day. If you don't make money, you don't keep the doors open, you don't get to play no more. <laughs> right. So, business is important. And it's the new year, too, plus. It's the new year. People got you know their money on their mind, their mind on their money. A good time to talk a little business, too. It is. So... We all ate our uh, black-eyed peas and cabbage and or greens, I'm assuming. Here in the South, at least. Here in the South. So, you know, we get to talk about money now. Maybe how to convert some of those nasty greens you ate into dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a greens fan, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> I think we could tell. Um, today's topic is price differentiation. Right. Specifically. And it's a pretty broad topic, once again, as with other topics we've done early on. There's probably going to be a couple of pullouts here we can make entire new episodes on from just one item. That may or may not happen later with these topics. I do not know. Right. And as always, you know, if there is something in one of these that you want to hear more about, let us know. Yeah, let us know. Always up for doing the research and converting a narrower top narrower topic into a much broader, much more full one. So, right. But price differentiation. What the hell is it? It's charging different prices. For different people, yes, basically. Yes. Um, basically, price differentiation starts out like this. Uh, for a haunted, we'll talk about it in context of a haunted attraction. I know, novel concept for a podcast called Haunt Weekly. Novel, novel. But anyways, if you charge a ticket price of $25 right, to people that come to your door, there are going to be some people that go, oh, that's too high. I can't pay that. Or I won't pay that. That experience isn't worth it. I'm not able to pay it. Whatever. Right. They're not going to pay it. Because it is a luxury yes. entertainment expense. It is a luxury. It is an entertainment expense. And someone might just say, you know, I'm going to take that 25 bucks and go see a movie. <laughs> yeah. They might, you know, something else. So they might not feel that 25 bucks is worth it. But on the opposite side of the scale... You have people that go, 25 good sir, the monocle-wearing crowd would gladly pay 50 <laughs> for this experience. Yeah. And either way, it's money walking out the door. Right. If you're able to turn a profit at less than $25, and most haunts probably could because, you know, the, yes, setup and all that is expensive, but the actual expense of an individual patron is typically fairly minimal beyond the, uh, the base costs of running the haunt. Right. Um, they probably can. But so whether you're letting someone who can't pay more but could still pay a profitable amount go through and they're walking away. Right. Or you're not getting the most amount of money you can from someone who is willing and able to pay more. Mm -hmm. Money is left on the table. And that's a, a pretty serious uh, problem. Now, to be clear... Price differentiation is got a long story and sometimes unfortunately colorful history, and it is in all industries. I mean, if you go to um, McDonald's right now, they will ask you if you want a large size combo. Right. That's price differentiation. Yes. Do you want to pay more for more? Yeah. Do you want to pay more for just a tiny little bit more of stuff that's practically free to us as a company? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, is what's going on because they'll give you more fries and more drink, but they're not giving you a bigger burger for that. No. 
No, but price differentiation, that's a good example. Now, the, the example that was a classic one given to me in um, college, in advertising class, and I always this one stuck with me now for 20 plus years, was train cars back in the golden age of train travel. Third class train cars did not have roofs. Right. Now, why did they not have roofs, you ask? Were roofs, like, super expensive? No, roofs are practically free to put on a train. In fact, it probably costs more to clean the rain up out of the train car than it did to, you know, put a roof on. But what it did is it ensured anyone who could afford a second class or first class ticket wouldn't just walk up to the counter and go, you know what, screw it, I'm doing third class today. Yeah. So it, that's one of the things you're trying to prevent is people choosing cheaper options than what they can afford. You don't want to see more money walked out the door, basically because of your price differentiation. And like I said, it's about, A, obtaining all the profitable customers you can, right? and getting the maximum amount you can out of the customers you have. Yeah. So, pretty straightforward stuff. And it's extremely important to the haunt industry. It is. Everybody struggles with <clears throat> how to get the most out of their customers. Yes. And, and for haunts, you know, we're open, like, what, one and a half months out of the year for Lucky? Yeah. Yeah, there are other ways um, throughout the year that haunts do make money. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're, the primary season's one and a half months. Right. But there are actual costs all year long. I mean, there's yes. rent, there's utilities, etc. And there's probably there's, some staff you got to pay. Yeah, there's okay. your core staff that you want to keep year-round so that they can help you with the build and the design and decorating and all of that. But yeah, and as you it just pointed out, there are ways, other ways haunts have been making money all year to kind of alleviate some of this pressure. Right. The newest way is the room escapes. Yes. Room escapes are now becoming a year-round attraction. Kind of like going to a laser tag arena, if anybody, you know, <laughs> remembers or, or goes to those. Hey, remembers nothing. We have three open in the city. I what know. What the hell? But we don't see... I'm going to laser tag now, just to spite you. Okay. So you and I go to laser tag? Okay, fair enough. But I don't know if, you know, and it's not a bad thing to do just to look at different open floor layouts and roaming, too. Yeah. Uh, that might be a topic Damn, that, for Oh, different... yeah, laser tag. Well, we can learn from the laser tag yeah. arenas on layout. That's interesting. It is. That, that's interesting. I like that. That's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But, yeah. But yeah, yeah. it's like going to a laser tag arena. Sorry. Yes. So <laughs> sidetrack you hopelessly. Yeah, no. It's a family event. It's not too scary. It's puzzle based. You know, it's it. And they're popular also with like the corporate crowd too. Yeah. If they if you aren't marketing your room escape to the corporate crowd, why not? You, you done goofed. Because that's a great team building experience and yeah. how to show leadership and. It's just, it's a missed opportunity if you're yeah. not. And the, the the room escapes can be as innocent and as cuddly as a teddy bear all the way to pretty horror-based. Yeah. Pretty flippin' scary. Um, so, yeah, be, be mindful of that. But there are other means, too. Like, um, haunts do hold events. Yes. Parties, uh, get-togethers. Right. Um, some weddings. Some weddings are at haunts, yeah. And also, a lot of, I know, like, the 13th Gate here... Right. has been used repeatedly as a movie set. Right. Movies um, and TV. They were in The Walking Dead some. Hmm. Um, I did not know that. See, I'm learning stuff today. Yeah. I'm learning stuff today. Yes. I I believe Necropolis was in there. Nice. Um, I, well, I can see that. That makes a great deal of sense. Necropolis would be in The Walking Dead. Yeah. But yeah, but basically, even with all these means, though, the primary core season, when you're mm -hmm. selling your tickets, you're making most of your bank, it's going to be a limited run. Yes. And that's a challenge because that means if you don't get A, you know, the, peep, the, the foot traffic, and B, you don't get an appropriate amount out of that foot traffic. Right. You have problems. Um, now, let's talk for a minute. Where have you seen um, a place that does it well? Um, this idea of price differentiation? Yeah. Um... You know, strangely, I'm going to say I think the mortuary here locally... That's mine, too. ...covers all the correct bases. Though I will say 
13th Gate does a decent job, in part because they have multiple attractions they can use to help with the upscaling some. Right, and that is another way to differentiate the price yeah, is to do bundle deals. Yes. If you're able to have multiple things for people to do, yeah. then offer a discount price and, for them to do them all. And it doesn't have to be like 13th Gate as two separate haunts. It can be like a haunt plus zombie laser tag or paintball or something. Right, yeah. Um, like what Rise does. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think... I don't remember if their first year they had a combo ticket to do both. You know? Yeah, I don't remember either, but um, <clears throat> honestly, I don't know. But yeah, they um, they do that now. Yes, they do. Um, but long story short, yeah, so they th those are the ones I would pick to do it well. Yeah. Um, and the thing about the mortuary yeah. is that early season, like opening week, they do family nights where Great everything's discounts, yeah. are rated. Yes, they're heavily discounted. That's usually when we got to go because it's the first one open in the area. Yeah, and, and we're we're doing haunt reviews, and that to us is just like the best time to get in on it anyway. Right. I know it's cruel to review a haunt on opening or next to opening weekend. We hear that all the time. I know. Yeah. But we've got to have time to get there, get the review done, get it online where people might actually have you know. A chance to, chance to see it. Right. And we're also working on our haunt. Our haunt, yeah. So, we... Our schedule in October is pretty boring. Don't come by in October, dude. No. That's true for Unless all Unless you're coming to visit the haunt. Okay. Come <laughs> then. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. Anyways. Um, so, they do that. They, uh, they do a VIP or normal ticket. The VIP mm. just gets you to the front of the line. And um, I think I heard a different entrance this time. Is that correct or not? I don't think that's correct this time. They've done it in the past, though, where VIPs right. have different entrances. Yeah, I think everybody went through a different and, way this time. But the um, other thing Mortuary does really, really well is coupons um, yeah. to their um, faithful, so to speak, to people they have email newsletters with and so forth. Right, and that's a way to keep in touch year-round. Yes. To let people know what's going on when you're opening, if you're having a special event. Um, and they also do the blood drive. Yes. And the blood drive, um, I was thinking that about it, and I was, you know, on the face value, they're losing money. Because if you donate blood, which is a great thing to do, um, you get a VI free VIP pass. But the thing is, is that also gets you, if you bring two friends, it gets them upgraded to a VIP pass yes. if they buy their tickets. So it encourages you to bring more people with you. Yes. And the other thing about it is, and this one thing we're going to get into in just a minute, is that it's not necessarily costing them money to put people into the VIP line. So yeah, let's, well that, that's a right. good segue into upscaling in general. Okay. Which, the main idea of upscaling is this is how you get more money from people who are willing to pay more. Yes. And the primary way the haunt industry does that, for better or for worse, and I grimace as I say this, is VIP lines. Yeah. So, I think that if they change the name to Fast Pass, I would be more comfortable with it. <laughs> because, you know, Fast The Fright P Express. The yeah, something. Because, you know, to me, VIP means it's something special. I'm getting a different experience than somebody else, or at least I should be getting something that's a little bit different, not just to skip the line. That's that's my issue, and I think it is just a word choice in my head. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think my issues run a little more deep, which I'll get into as we do it. Mm -hmm. As we, But yeah, basically the idea of a VIP line, for like anyone listening to this podcast who's never been to a haunted attraction, if that's the case... You probably clicked the wrong podcast on Podbean. You're and probably lost. You're probably lost. Go go find another podcast. But <laughs> Or stick around. Or stick around. Hey, it's your choice. If you find us that interesting, <laughs> please stick around. But the point is, VIP lines basically allow you to skip the queue. Yes. And this is the thing. Most, haunted, most popular haunted attractions, at least because they're trying to get so many people through in such a short season, right. have pretty lengthy lines. Yes. Especially on big nights. Right. The idea of a VIP line is that, hey, you get to skip the queue and you get to join the much shorter VIP line and go in that way. And, like, for example, like a haunt like the 13th Gate, we have waited upwards of 90 minutes in a queue 
before to get in when we went on a the first year yeah the very first year we went on probably the worst night we could have yeah we kind of did it to ourselves people i'm just saying yeah um and we ended up waiting for not because at the time i remember the line was literally wrapped around the block yeah it was it It was was crazy it was crazy um and that was our own doing we chose a terrible night to go yeah we've since known we've since learned which days are their slower days and to go then yeah, and that's great because we also get to see and meet people and, you know, it's it's yeah. just a chiller atmosphere for us. Yeah. But, so basically, it allows you to skip the bulk of the line. Now, you still have to be in the VIP line. Right. So, if there's a bunch of people who bought the VIP tickets, you could still be in a lengthy queue. Yes. That can still happen, but that's much less likely because I would say probably, you know, 90 plus percent of people are only going to pay for the regular ticket. Right. Right. Um, the advantage for the haunt is that this is free. Yeah. It's free to them. They are getting an extra $15, $20, whatever it is, $10, 15 20 $25 per ticket for nothing. <laughs> there yeah. There's no actual cost. They have the actual cost of setting up the line, the physical um, the barricades and all that. Yeah. But it's free. Mm-hmm. Um... And the reason it's free to them is because, and this is the part that makes me kind of you know squicky and uneasy, is that it's the regular customers that are paying the cost. Right. It's it is the diehard fans. Yeah. You know. Because basically, if I go through a haunt with a regular ticket, mm-hmm. um, what the haunted attraction is doing is they're selling my time and my experience to get more money from that guy. Right. And that feels, you know, weird to me. Yeah. Well, and it's also a cost. It's also, you know, a differentiation between um, people who, like you were saying earlier, who can pay more. Yeah. And growing up as someone who couldn't pay more. It, well, we can't pay more now because we go through so many per year. I mean, if we... Yeah, we have to look for the best deals possible. If, if we went VIP every single haunt we went through, we could do it like a dozen a year. Ellie would be out of blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We would have drained her dry. Yes. <laughs> She'd be a little sugar raisin on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, if we went VIP every attraction we went to mm-hmm. we would never be able to afford it right um there's just no way it's too much especially with us doing our own haunt yeah it's it's barely doable now with the with how many we go to yeah just because prices are fairly it's it's an expensive treat out it is and then you tack on the vip on top of that which typically comes close to doubling it right and yeah, it's just too much for us. Yeah, and well, and the other thing about VIPs is that the few times that I've gone VIP, um, I got a worse experience. Yeah, well, I was like, okay, so at Mortuary, you don't get to see the line queue show. Yeah, because there is a little staging area and stuff goes on, and they have a few front of house actors yeah. and stuff, and yeah, you get to skip all of that. Yeah. Whoopee! <laughs> yeah, you, you don't get to yeah. get any of that. Um, at 13th Gate, you go up beside all of the catacombs that the regular line walks through. Yeah. That also has haunt actors yeah. interacting. And that is, that is something to think about VIP lines is if you've invested a lot of money and time into making a good front of house experience. Right. And now you're letting your highest paying customers skip the queue right how do they get that experience yeah because i mean that's that's the most frustrating for me and of course at house of shock you get to feel the heat of the fires which is not really well that is if you get lucky and you're actually on that front row and not because the way it's like an l with the side of it going back yeah there's this probably one of the worst to get the vip yeah i would agree with that just because if you are at the back of the line you're getting a less More good show than people that just showed up middle of the pack in the regular line. Right. Yeah, you're right. And 
at least, and granted, we didn't go House of Shock last, no, no, VIP at House of Shock last year, so I no. can't testify whether that's still true or not. But previous years where we had, we actually got screwed, and um, we're we're the furthest back people from the stage show. Yeah, no, we um we watched the line fill up around because their VIP line goes around the outside, regular line, yeah, outside of the regular yeah. line. So it's still set up that way. Okay, so it's still that way. So yeah, yeah, if you are one of the first VIPs in, you'll be right there at the front of the stage show, get to crane your neck upwards and feel the heat of all the pyrotechnics. Right. If you're toward the middle or the back of the VIP line, you know you're going to be getting a worse view than the plebs. <laughs> right. Basically. But yeah, and 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 that's the thing is a lot of haunts have been trying to expand sort of the other benefits. Right. Of um, the VIP experience a little bit. And I think that's a good idea. Like, we mentioned the House of Shock doing the better view of the stage show. Right. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. Maybe the execution's not ideal. Right. Um, but a lot of haunts also have been giving away t-shirts and mm -hmm. physical goods. You don't see that too much because it is a physical expense. Right. We saw that more in, a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that one's kind of died down a little bit, but it was a common thing. Get a free cozy or koozie. Which is it? Is it a cozy or is it a koozie? I, I think it's a koozie. It's a koozie? It's a koozie. All right, it's a koozie. Um, <laughs> get a free koozie or a free t-shirt or hat or whatever. And usually that's just surplus merchandise that they have to move. So it's not right. technically a cost, but at the same time it is a cost. You know? Yeah. It's something they could... And I remember one year, a, a while ago, the House of Shock... I mean, not the House of Shock, 13th Gate, actually had a special small section of the haunt mm -hmm. only for people who ordered and went through a certain process. And that was terminally disappointing. <laughs> yeah. You had to get a password, and then um, you told it to one of the actors, and the actor would funnel you either through a shortcut or, if you knew the password, through the long way. Mm -hmm. And you would get the additional room. The additional room or rooms was not... Yeah, but I like the idea. The idea is good, but it, it, but now you're getting into the you have to build two sections of your haunt. You have to build, and I mean that's. Yeah, well, I mean that's, but if you did that, that's another way, a reason for people to come back too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. get a second ticket out of them because if they go through the normal way and they hear outside. Oh, we went VIP, and we got this extra room. And it was really the, awesome, and not just some lame room that you threw together. Yeah. Then they're going to want to buy a ticket, a, a VIP ticket at that point, to go back to see what they didn't see. Yeah. And that also speaks to another topic we've already sort of penciled in about agency in haunted houses, and that idea of that choice. Right. Where you can make decisions and have different paths and so forth. Yeah. So, yeah, but... But yeah, it's the same idea, but the agency in this case is a VIP ticket. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, th there are haunts that have played, at least played around with that. I don't see that too often, though. Typically speaking, one, if you pay for your VIP ticket, once you get in the front door, it's largely the same experience for everyone. Right. And that's just because it's easier to build and operate a haunt that way. Yes. Um... But there are some who do provide special experiences to people who uh, pay a little bit more. Right. Several haunts uh, out there will sort of um, become, quote unquote, scarier. They'll go yeah. become more aggressive. Yeah. Higher paying customers. Yeah. Um, I first heard about this at Eastern State Penn. They do a haunted house every year. And basically what they were doing was if you... Paid extra and agreed to it. Yeah, basically you... They would... You were giving consent for them to touch you. Yeah, you basically bought like a necklace or something. Yeah. And I've, I've never... Been, I've been to Eastern State Pen, but not right. as the haunted attraction. We, we went as a tourist attraction. Right, and then found out about the haunted attraction and want to go well, back. We, we'd heard about the haunted attraction previously. Been able to. But we just... It, we're, us in Philadelphia in October has not happened. We're from New no. Orleans. <laughs> There's some things that don't line up. Yeah. But yeah, um, so the idea is you pay a, a little bit more, and now people can touch you, can grab you, can pin you against walls, can, can drag pull you, you away from yeah. your group. Exactly. Um, and like I said, touch versus no touch, 
That's a, that's a topic we're really looking forward to covering, and we've got a yeah. special guest who's an actual expert in that, because yeah. we're not experts in that area because we've never actually worked with Touch Hans. Right. Um, so I have nothing to offer on that. Um, a, another... Well, the, real quick on that. Okay. Is that of the reviews yeah. that I had read about the experience, the people who paid the extra and got the necklace got a much higher quality experience than the ones who didn't because the ones who didn't were pretty much ignored by all the actors yeah and that's a bad way to do that yeah i i and that's one of the and that's kind of the nature of the the upscaling problem yeah is you have to do stuff that is free or cheap for you to do to get more because that's the whole point of upscaling is you're not going to spend a lot more to get more out of them this is just a right. way to make you know them feel more special yes and so, but if you upscale and then you upscale at the expense of your regular paying customers, right? You've got a problem. Yes. And that apparently that's what I and I read the reviews too. A lot of people described it as a big problem at Eastern State Pen. Right. Was if they saw someone with a necklace, it was <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fresh meat, and attack that person, and then completely ignore the customers that didn't. Yeah. Uh, agree to didn't either didn't agree to or didn't shell out the little bit of extra money or whatever. Right. Um, that is a huge problem, and another means of upscaling is simply, and this is also upscaling and downscaling, is setting special prices for special days. Yes. You want to go to our haunt on Halloween night? That's going to cost you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense because you know. It is the night that yeah. you're going to have the most people there. Yes. And it, it's also about spreading the crowd out a little bit. Because if absolutely every single one of your customers mm -hmm. came out Halloween night, <laughs> no one could handle that. No. <laughs> that That's impossible. From a capacity yeah. standpoint, that is impossible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's all about spread. So that's a little bit about spreading up. People are like, well, I don't want to pay the, you know, twenty extra dollars to go on Halloween night. I'll, you know, I'll save my save me some money and go the the Thursday before, whatever. Right. You know, that's fine. That means you have more customers shifting to that Thursday, and you don't have to worry so much about your throughput on Halloween night. Right. And it, you could actually do a sliding scale, where you know, nights in September when. Only people who are really, really interested in Halloween and haunted houses. We're raising our hands in here. You can't see guilty. it because this is an audio podcast. Yes, guilty. Um, so, yeah, people like us who are thinking about it in September and other haunters who might be able to go in September um, pay would pay less. And then as you get closer and closer to the date... Each weekend go would go up a little bit. I yeah. could see that working. Yeah, Eastern State Pen, going back to them, also does that. Uh huh. But my problem with that is now your prices are flipping unpredictable, and you've got to look at the website. You've got to look at. Yes, you've actually got to interact with the haunts. Yeah, media, media. their media in order to figure out the price, and it also makes promotion a little more complicated because when you're putting out your flyers. Now you have a lot of prices to mention, where if you yeah. just do a regular price and a VIP price, you have two prices to mention, plus maybe like a discount day or something. Right. Um, but normally that's all you would have is two prices. You know, regular ticket, $25, VIP, 40 or whatever, yeah. and that's it. You know, you don't want, you know, your 30-second commercial to be 15 seconds of your prices. Right. So, yeah, it, it's... It, Complicated pricing can be a great way to do a sliding scale, but um, it's all, it also comes with its own pitfalls that you have to find a way to overcome. Right. Um, and, but another popular means of upscaling we see in almost every haunted attraction we visit is the old merch booth, though. This is an example yeah. that people don't think of as upscaling, but it is. Yeah. No, <clears throat> I, I think of it as additional products for me to buy to support the haunt. Yeah. You yeah. know? But... That's because you're willing and able to pay more for that haunt experience to have something to take home. Right, exactly. Like, I know every year my um, brother asks me, what's the new 13th Gate t-shirt? Can you get it for me for Christmas? 
And then they'll have it, but not in his size. And then it's a yeah. whole big drama llama. <laughs> yeah, but it'll it's gonna get easier this it's next year. It's getting easier, actually. Yeah, so we might yes. actually it's gonna get a lot easier, actually. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, but t-shirts, flashlights, caps, koozies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> Button stickers, Button. and and that is one of the nice things about a really well stocked merch thing is yeah. they, you know, they have things that are cheap. And things that are up to T-shirt and jacket yeah, prices. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this: if you're going to have a merch booth, and I think you should. Yeah. I really do because I, I, even though a merch booth provides an upfront cost, because you got to print the T-shirts, you got to print the caps, you got to get the stickers, you know, all that stuff has. There's a cost there. I get that. But if you're gonna have a merch booth, have a well-stocked one at a great location. Right. And like loca- location is accessible both by the line and by people leaving the haunt, ideally. Yeah, um, a good example of that from around here is Rise. Yes. Because you can get to the merch booth from outside, but the line actually walks right past it. And Mortuary does that too. And 13th Gate also. Yeah. 13th Gate actually has two booths set up. Yeah, they do. And sometimes one booth doesn't have exactly what the other one has. Yeah, that's a little weird. Yeah. But like the one inside... Typically is where you would get like all the glow necklaces and flashlights and that stuff. Right. But they their selection of T-shirts is highly limited on the inside. You got to mm-hmm. go to the one outside for the full. You know. But the thing about Rise though is in their merch booth is that it's not particularly well stocked. No, it's not. But it's affordable. Yeah, they have T-shirts. They have koozies. And yeah, because their T-shirt was what ten dollars. Yeah. No, their pricing is great. Well, the pricing is great for the customer. For us, yes. But, not, but maybe not for them. I don't yeah. Think. Because, yeah. I mean, and the other thing is, is if you sell a t-shirt, you've got to look at that as free promotion for you. Yeah. Because, you know, people are going to wear it. Mm-hmm. That's the purpose of buying it. They're not going to frame it and put it on a wall. What, you don't frame t-shirts? Oh my God, I learned something. Okay. So, <laughs> a very small percentage will. But, you know, I know that... We always try to get at least one shirt, and I will wear it year-round. Mm-hmm. You know, I cycle through them because I just like them. I think they're comfortable. Yeah. And... But, but a well-stocked merch booth has a variety of stuff in, pri- in variety of price ranges. Right. Um, you want everything from the people that can only afford a few extra bucks. Maybe they can get a calendar or a postcard or something. Yeah. All the way up to people that want to buy the uh, hoodies and jackets and right the expensive stuff. And so my advice is, if you're going to have a merch booth in, you should make it, you know, well, put it well and keep it well stocked. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about the other side of this downscaling. Okay. Um, downscaling is when you basically are reaching out to people who maybe can't or don't want to pay your base ticket price, but still want to go and still might be customers you can put through at a profit. That's us. Yeah. That sounds like us. <laughs> sounds like us. <laughs> well, <clears throat> the most common way, and this is true not just in the haunted attraction industry, but also any uh, entertainment industry, I would argue, is coupons. Yes. Coupons. Coupons. Um... And coupons, it, it's interesting because they range in the haunt industry from like five bucks off to a few, you know, like a, a hardcore dollar amount, right? To a percentage off, or right. to you know, special members only days and things like that. Yeah, I've, I mainly see the five dollars off. Yeah, that seems to be the point, um, at which a lot of the coupons are for. Five to ten off usually is is the most common, but they do exist in all sizes. And sometimes it would be like BOGO offers. Yeah. Bring a friend. Friend gets in free type deal. Um, yeah. You've got to be really, really careful with coupons, though. Yeah. You've got to be silly careful with this. Because at some point, if you're offering a $5 coupon for the entire season, then you might as well just drop your price $5. Yeah. And... A good example, this actually happened to me um, when I was in college. There was a little hot dog place, um, Crystal remembers it, <laughs> Sandy's Hot Dog, yeah. not too far from our apartment. And basically, Sandy's Hot Dog um, was known for their coupons. 
Yeah. You could get Sandy's coupons, those bright yellow and red coupons. You still can. You still can, I know. But you could and still can get them everywhere. They yeah. were everywhere on the planet. You could get them in every public newspaper, every magazine. And they all had the same coupon, the 99-cent chili dog. Yep. Well, I remember once I was walking to my class, and I had to, li- I had to get lunch. I was literally walking right past Sandy's going down toward the Coliseum. And long and short of it is, I didn't have any Sandy's coupons on me. Mm-hmm. <gasps> I know, right? Horrible. Yeah. Horror of horrors. But I'm like, you know what? I just want two chili dogs. Yeah. It's 50 cents more per dog. I'm paying, it's worth the extra dollar to not have to hunt for a coupon. Right. Even to my broke ass college self, it was worth it. So I walk in, they're in the lunch rush, and say, I want two, um, two chili dogs and a drink. And she holds out her hands for the coupons. I'm like, I don't have a coupon. Sorry. She had to get her manager to come over and show her how to ring it up <laughs> because that's how few customers they have without coupons. And that's the problem. Coupons can be addictive. They can be so that your customers expect and will only patronize your business if they have a coupon. Right. And that's one of the things to remember in business in general is once you give a customer something, they're going to expect it. Yeah. So you got to make it so that your business is not addicted to coupons. And one of the ways I think that haunts can do this, and other businesses too, is basically give the coupons and the discounts in exchange for something else. Yeah. And a good example in the haunt industry is give us your email address, we'll email you coupons. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we're going to give you a $5 or whatever discount, but we're going to have your email address and be able to stay in contact with you all year in return. Yeah. Well, and I think that the other thing is um, is to make it a limited time. Yeah. Not the entire season. I agree with that. Because then you're going to have people who are just coming back on coupon after coupon. Yeah. Granted, they're coming back, but... (sighs) But, once again, you've got people who probably could and would pay more. Right. And that's the issue. Is you, it's going back to the train car thing. You're you're making them available so people who have no other option or wouldn't otherwise not do it. Right. Because somewhere, I guarantee you, for your haunt, you, they're going twenty five bucks. That's a rip off. Twenty dollars. That's a deal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm jumping on the twenty dollars. That's that's actually how people think about these things. Yeah. Yeah. And. and and I do also really like the um, the idea of opening weekend being cheaper. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know you're not going to get the same experience as somebody at the end nope. when all the actors are, you know, on point. It's a chance to for the actors to learn their roles really well um, without having, you know... The VIPs and... The, yeah, the people who are expecting the premium show... Right then, yeah, uh, and because we understand that when we, we yeah. do them, uh, and then that's why when we do go through haunts it. opening weekend and we do reviews, we always say we went on opening weekend, yeah, and we always try to go easy on the actors in the review, yeah. Well, we might talk about the quantity of actors, yeah. We might talk about, we'll definitely talk about the quality of the sets and the layout and things like that, right. things that should be set at that point. But yeah, we try to take it easy on the actors for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, my, but yeah, limiting access to the coupons and basically making it so that the coupons are in return for something are your two major means of restricting that. Right. Um, and I think both are excellent for use by haunt. And I know a lot of haunts will give out those flyers like to, you know, like every spirit store in the country. And they yeah. hear it, it says, bring this, get $5 off or whatever. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. But, like I said, you have to put some kind of limit on that. Otherwise, everyone's just going to run to a spirit store before you know, they go. It's kind of when Six Flags would do the, I don't know if they still do it or not. They do. $5 off if you bring a Coke can. Yep. How many people went scrounging in trash cans for Coke cans prior to heading yeah. to Six Flags? That's just, you know, so, uh, every, everyone knows Six Flags means, you know, bring a Coke can. And get a few bucks off. Now, that being said, they have an arrangement with Coke, and I don't know the exact financials of it. 
But I'm pretty sure it's beneficial to Six Flags that you bring the Coke can. It's not just $5 out the door to them, basically. Right. Um, but long and short of it is, it would be $5 out the door to you if that's how it worked. If it motivates a customer who otherwise would not come to come, then it's a boon. But if it's an already established and willing to pay customer taking advantage of a coupon just because, it's money out the door. Yeah. And you know, finding ways to minimize that is going to be one of the most important things to do. To do. Um, one thing that we've been giving Mortuary a lot of credit in this area, one thing they don't do well, though, is limiting their coupons. Yes, they are available year-round. And it's bad because they will say they're for a limited period of time or a month of whatever or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. this week only. But if you use them online, you can still use them. Yeah. As I discovered accidentally. <laughs> yeah, that might be one of... And I don't know if that's... So the problem with that is that it seems to be more of a online issue than a restricting the coupon no. issue because it's not a physical coupon. Yeah. And, but that's the thing is coupon. if you're going to restrict it, make sure you restrict it. Yeah. Make sure all venues, including online and um, physical point of sale, it's restricted. Yes. You've got to make sure to do that thoroughly. Uh, like I said, use it to build customer loyalty. Collect those email addresses. Collect those numbers for text message alerts. Get them to sign up on social media. Give them out on your Facebook group page. Give right. them out on your Twitters and all that. Um, but use it to build customer loyalty. And like I said, if you have an online ticketing system yeah. that does not have the ability to take coupons, fix that. Yeah. Just fix um, that. One thing real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, that I just thought about was years ago when we first started going to 13th Gate, they had season passes. Yes. And they, and I think the mortuary may have too the first year. Yeah, they did it previously. And, um, but like, everybody's gotten away from that. Yeah, I, I did not see a single haunt we went to in the past two years that had at least an advertised season pass. They may have right. offered it like as a hush hush secret code type thing that I'm not aware of. No. Yeah. You know, but they did, you're right. That's a good point. And I, I guess they weren't selling. I don't honestly know enough about that. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, is that once again, it's not an extra cost. You know, yeah. and you could charge the price of three tickets mm -hmm. for a season pass, because we had friends who bought the season pass to Mortuary. I mean, to Thirteenth Gate. Yeah. And they went two times. Yeah. So if the price was three. Or two and a half, even. Yeah. Or, or even just two, theoretically. Yeah. Um, yeah. The I think the issue with season passes, though, is that they make sense at, like, amusement parks. Because when you get someone indoor, inside, indoors, <laughs> inside an amusement park, they're buying food, they're buying drink, they're buying other things. Yeah. Haunts really don't have much else to capitalize on them, other than merch. And yeah. maybe some, like snacky stuff yeah well i know that for a while there we were making several trips a year to um 13th gate yeah. and to a couple of the other haunts and the reason was we would say this is great we should bring people so then we'd have a few people that were available this weekend a few people that were available that weekend so yeah our calls that year were pretty astronomical yeah <laughs> But, yes. but it was because we were bringing new people to see, you know. Yeah, it, that, you're right, though. That has fallen by the wayside. And I, I don't know why. Maybe we should ask around and maybe bring yeah. this up in a future episode. This is something we can research and figure out. Yeah. Um, we, we know some people. We, we got some email addresses. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons we don't go as often. Because even though we didn't have the season pass that year, we had decided we were going to get it the next year. And then it wasn't there. And then it wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. because we do. We take, a, oh, I think we made four trips that year. Yeah, but in all different, seriousness. Did, different groups of people. If, if you have a haunt that people regularly visit over mm -hmm. and over and over again, and a good example of that might be if you have a haunt especially like in a rural area that attracts a lot of repeat customers. Right. Because there's not much else else to do. Right. A season pass might make a lot of sense, especially if you can find other ways to capitalize and profit from customers once they're there. Right. And that, that thing is going to be the key trick to it. It's, it's all great and good that people come back on a season pass, 
but there's yeah. got to be a way to get additional revenue on them. So something to think about. We're, we're, we're going to do some. I think we're going to dig on, in on this and yeah. find out what what's up. I, I'm going to send some emails. Okay. I think that's a good that's a good topic for later. Um, the other way to downscale, of course, we touched on it briefly, is discount days. Yes. Whether it's early in the season when you're doing the like I said the opening weekend and it's ten dollars off because it's opening weekend. Right. And, or if you're doing it like after Halloween, the super late season one, the right. early November flashlight nights are usually discounted. Yeah. Flashlight nights in general I I have an issue with, but that's because I go to haunted houses for different reasons. Yeah. Than most of the populace. Because on flashlight night, the lights are off, and you can't have see all the stuff. Light. I know. You can't see anything. Can't see, you can't all, see of, all of your hard work and time is just not there. You, oh, yeah. yeah it, it's it's nice. frustrating. Um, I agree with that. But we've done it once. We're completely disappointed. We did it arise, didn't we? Uh, mortuary. Um, I think we want it rise too. That's where I got the little finger light. Okay, I, I think we I did don't, it rise once too. I I really okay. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in basically what we determined it was hiding wasn't the props or scenes, but the lack of actors who had already checked out. Yeah, they were done. <laughs> that's yeah. that's what we determined was the reason for the flashlight night. Yeah. But yeah, Please let us know if that's incorrect. But. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but the thing is this. These discounts are great for early and late in season. We talked about how it's good for shifting. Right. Because if every person in the world shows up on Halloween night, you're screwed. Yeah. You can't put them all through. Yes, you'll be at 100% capacity. That night will be great, but your season will be a bust. Right. You've got to find ways to motivate people to come on nights that are not named Halloween. Yes. And one of the ways you do that is you offer discounts or you increase the price on Halloween too, the upscaling side of this. Right. Um, but basically you offer discounts and let people uh, come through the haunt at cheaper prices other nights of the year. And for like Mortuary, it's pretty crucial that they do this because their season starts fairly early. They start like yeah. early to mid-September. They're usually open by September 15th. Yeah. And only lunatics thinking about haunting at that time are us. And apparently birthday parties of teen girls going around in buses. Yeah, that was fun. That was um, amusing. Yeah. And the thing is, is that a lot of the times, um, people that I talk to who go to mortuary, they don't know about those early yeah. dates. They aren't. They're not promoted very well, I agree. Well... And that might be on purpose. I think you're probably right. Yeah. Because we hear about, and this is going back to the getting people's information bit. Right. I know about them because they've got like every email address I have ever used in all of history yeah. in their database somewhere. Yeah. And so every year when they're announcing their um, early night, I get like 10 copies of it. And Yeah. Yeah, I think that we also stumbled upon it one year and just know to check now. Yeah. Um, but if everybody said, oh, great, we can go for this discounted rate, then you'd have the same problem as everybody showing up on Halloween. Well, I, I, I don't know how bad that would be, though, because early September, how many people are really, even at 15 bucks a head, how many people are really going to show up for a haunt? Yeah, we've never seen a really long line. No, that's the, other, that's, that's the other reason we enjoy going on those nights is because the line usually is pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. And... You know, that's that's one of the, I guess, the, the sort of going back to the downscaling benefits here, going on those nights, <laughs> you, you get a slightly better experience because you're not, you know, assholes and elbows with everyone right. in the city <laughs> in line. Um, and one thing, um, one thing we didn't mention, and this is something I just realized we actually did not cover, um, if you're going to do a VIP line, mm -hmm. there's something that you need. You need a line. Yeah. There have been a couple of times we saw deals online for VIP. Not necessarily, it wasn't like the 13th Gate, but it was other places we visited. And we're like, we only have like an hour to there. Yeah. We can't chance there being a long line yeah. and us getting stuck. Yeah, and, and they've got a deal where VIP is five bucks more 
online. So he sprung for the VIP. We get there. It's us and the actors. Yeah. And so, oh, well, you get the VIP line. Whoop, there you go. Around absolutely nobody. Yeah, that actually was at 13th Gate. Yeah, that was 13th Gate one year that happened to us because we went on like a Thursday or something, but also happened, yeah. I think, in Monroe. Yeah. Um, that haunt that we went to there. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I can go back to the reviews. Yeah. Happened to us there. Um, but long and short of it is you, you got to have a line. If you do not have a line... No one's going to pay VIP. Yeah, no one's going to pay VIP, and long and short of it is it's just not <laughs> worth it to have it. Yeah, we had that one place in Mississippi that's like, oh, yeah, you definitely want to get the VIP tickets. There's a long line right around the corner. Yeah, oh, yeah, the terror. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, oh, it was yeah. terror test. It was terror test. Yeah. We walk out and like, and we'll chance it because we we had planned the entire night to be in Mississippi that time yeah. around, so that we were not rushing for anything. And yeah. that was the last haunt we were doing anyway. Right. We were on the way back. Like, nah, if you guys are open, I'm kind of cool chilling in line. It feels great outside. Yeah. We get there to six people. Yeah. There's there's not. <laughs> there's six people. Yeah. They were. They they started off on the wrong yeah. foot with us that year, <laughs> and it didn't get better. No. Um, sorry to say, uh, but yeah, it, it's. Yeah, you don't want to start off by lying to the customers. <laughs> well, and part of it is, and I was thinking about this, I don't know if she was lying or she genuinely didn't know. He. He, sorry, he didn't know. I think he knew. He, he probably was did, but, you know, long and short of it is, don't, if, if, if you need a consistent cue. Now, here's the thing. Getting back on all this, and we've often talked about what we would do mm-hmm. when and if we do GoPro. Yeah. And the haunts we have worked with and helped manage, etc. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not comfortable with VIP lines because I don't like them for all the reasons I stated. Right. But if I had a haunt, and if I had a haunt with an adequate line, I would probably do it. Yeah. Just because you need to. You know, it's a necessity. You need to get that money. Yeah. And, yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's almost a necessary evil of the haunt industry. Yeah. But, yeah, all in all, the point of this uh, rather lengthy dialogue, we should be winding up now, is that when it comes to your customers, the price, even though you have one price point for the entirety of your haunt, that does not mean one price point is right for every single customer. Right. So you have to find ways, and this is one of your challenges, to both reach the customers who can't or don't want to pay your price point and to get more out of those who are willing to pay more. Right. Um, one idea that we didn't talk about also, but I'll touch on real quick, is a uh, it's something that's been floated around mm-hmm. a lights on family day for the ones that aren't too too scary, but that's something we might touch on later. Yeah, but yeah, basically try to find ways to maximize the number of people who can and are willing to attend your haunt and right. maximize the profit per customer. That that yeah. that average revenue per customer is going to be crucial. To all haunted attractions. Yes. Well, I think we're just about out of time. We've been at this for a little bit over 50 minutes. Do you have any final thoughts? Anything else to share? Happy New Year. Happy New Year, yeah. So <laughs> I hope you ate your black eyed peas and greens yes. or cabbage, depending upon or the specific region. Whatever your, your, your tradition, tradition is. is. Hope it brings good luck and great tidings for the 2016 season. And we.